Sadegi to come up um, to introduce David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not much more of an introduction. I think that was great. So, um, <clears throat> so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Shackleford, who's coming to us all the way from California. David is an associate professor. Congratulations on your somewhat recent tenure now. Uh, and he's also uh, the associate director of the Metabolism Research Center at UCLA. He's in the division of pulmonary and critical care medicine at UCLA. His uh, training has been with some of the leaders in the field. He's had training with uh, Ruben Shaw at the Salk Institute and with Paul Michel and Steve Dubinet at UCLA on translational cancer and metabolic research. Uh, David has been a personal friend. He's, he's nice enough that he's often mistaken for a Canadian. And he's been instrumental for me and our research in translating some of our basic science work in pet tracer development for understanding molecular mechanisms of lung cancer and developing therapeutic strategies. So hopefully you hear more from him. David, please. All right, Sam and Sheila, thank you for that really nice introduction. So um, it has been an absolutely wonderful day. So this is a great, um, great way to end the day. Um, and what I want to talk to you about is work that is near and dear to my heart and our groups. And that's really studying the role of mitochondria metabolism in lung cancer. So the title is, you know, three-dimensional um, imaging, um, both structural and functional. And so what I'm going to do is tell you um, a published work that Sam and I had uh, started years ago um, about, you know, functionally imaging um, mitochondrial activity with pet tracers. And then I want to share with you some unpublished um, studies and work that we're doing that I'm very excited about and kind of finish it um, off with some translational work work that we've begun um, years ago and that we've actually been able to get into clinical trials and testing and, and something that I'm very proud of um, because it's, it's been you know a lot of years in the works. We're not sure if it's successful or will be successful, but I think it's really great. And given all the great work that's going on here, I hope this will be a, um, you know, very relevant to what you guys are working on. So just a quick overview. Um, I'm not sure if this pointer is working. There you go. So what I'm gonna tell you about are these imaging approaches that we're doing. And this is really sort of a top-down view in which we're using PET imaging to image the entire lung tumor, the Google Earth, if you will, of the tumor. And we're now really going down and we've been working on different platforms, I'm just gonna tell you about, to scale, to get to a scale of ultra resolution and that we can get down to the ultra structures of the mitochondrial cristae and really allowing us to interrogate not only cell-cell interactions in the entire tumor, but the cellular organization of organelles and not just mitochondria, not just nuclei, but how they all work together. Um, so, so, so I will show you some new data that we're very excited about. Um, so like I said, the first part I'll tell you about is this FBNTP um, PET tracer um, that we worked on and how we're using it to study mitochondrial bioenergetics, how we're coupling PET imaging with three-dimensional electron microscopy to, to, to generate these um, three-dimensional ultra-resolution maps, um, how we're really looking at um, cellular compartmentalization of bioenergetics. Um, and what we found is these really interesting mitochondrial lipid droplet interactions. Um, and last, let's just wrap it up with clinical translation of some of our metabolic therapies. And, uh, you know, again, this is just early days. This is the start, I think, and I, what I'm hoping for of a lot of really great work and hopefully some really great collaboration uh, in the future with everyone here. All right. So we focus on lung cancer. And as you may or may not know, it is a very heterogeneous and complex disease. Okay, it's a devastating disease. Um, and even though we've had a number of, um, of breakthroughs, especially in the realm of immunotherapy, you know, early detection and intervention um, remain the best chance for a cure. So why is that? Well, it's heterogeneous at a genetic and molecular um, level, so it makes it very complicated. Aside of beyond uh, melanoma, lung cancer has some of the highest mutational burden. So genetically, it's very difficult. We still stratify it genetically, but it's very, it's, it's more the exception than the norm to, uh, to treat lung cancer with targeted therapies. Um, it has multiple histologies to the, and shown here are the different histologies of non-small cell lung cancer with small cell lung cancer representing about 15% and non-small cell, the remaining 85. 
We focus on the two main histologies, lung adenocarcinoma and lung squamous, and I'll be talking extensively about these two histologies and really hoping to convince you that they, they reside in the lung, but they couldn't be more different, not only in treatment response, but um, and, and a lot of that in how they're organized, both um, you know, organized metabolically. And that really gets to this idea of metabolic heterogeneity. Um, and really from the focal point from our standpoint is mitochondria. Okay, so my lab is split up into really two, you know, two sides, you know, um, basic research that we integrate with translational research. And so I'm gonna give you a flavor and a sampling of a little bit of both, focusing first on the basic research and then, and then hopefully showing you how we've been able to translate that into clinical. And I will say, you know, this is, this is work that's not just from our lab. This is great efforts with fantastic clinicians and a lot of people working in chemists and, and, and working all together to really um, do this work. So very grateful for all the fantastic help we've had along the way. So mitochondria in cancer. So this is a picture adapted from a, a review, leading edge review from Marsha Hagas a few years back. And the point is just to show that the mitochondria do a lot of things. They have their hands involved in a number of critical roles in the cell, which you're all quite familiar with, you know, metabolism, and bioenergetics, that that's usually gets the big headlines, right? You know, powerhouse of the cell, um, ATP generation through oxidative phosphorylation. And that's going to be a focal point of what I talk about, um, as well as structural regulation and, and you know, known as fusion and fission dynamics. What's really amazing about the mitochondria is this organelle the structure dictates its function. And, but the mitochondria work in response to stress. So you have this cellular engine that will adapt and change to stress environment. And I liken it to, I was talking to Sheila about this, a car where you drive it to work and depending on the stress, when you open up the engine, you're not sure what you're gonna get. So we typically think of things like an engine in a car or something as being static. This is dynamic. And this is something that's really, really fantastic, especially in terms of understanding how these dynamic machines change in the course of disease progression, therapy response. And in particular, can we start to manipulate these? Can we start to categorize these? And you might think is for us, it's logically as well, if we're gonna do you know, sequencing of, of you know, thousands of genes, could we also begin categorizing structure of mitochondria very specifically? All right, so they regulate oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species. There's biogenesis and mitophagy or turnover. And they also um, have a, a very important role in signaling, you know, oncometabolites, et cetera. All right, so we'll focus on these two main things really for today's talk. All right, so I want to take a little bit of time just to kind of refresh everyone's memory, um, especially in terms of how mitochondria function and their structure. And, and this really is this picture here. You know, when I started working on mitochondria, I just imagined this kind of two-dimensional bean shape and they exist in these beautiful tubules. And that's because we look at everything in two dimension. We look at old images in two dimension and we don't realize that these are actually, um, when you put this in three, day, three dimension, they form these beautiful, um, beautiful structures. Um, and this is, um, and within the Chris Day resides the electron transport chain, um, which undergoes um, oxidative phosphorylation and the generation of ATP. And to image mitochondria, many of you have used you know, lipophilic cation dyes, uh, such as TMRE, JC1, to look at the, to measure the proton motive force that is needed to generate um, electron transport um, and ultimately ATP. Um, and I'll say, and I'll tell you how we use this type of chemistry and this type of, um, uh, this type of biology, Sam and I working together to generate PET tracers that we could actually take advantage of this proton motor force and begin measure changes in mitochondrial membrane potential and ultimately using these PET tracers as surrogate markers of mitochondrial activity. All right, so this is a, a kind of a, this is a very nice uh, cartoon of the uh, PET tracer FPNTP. It's a triphenylphosphonium based um, positively charged molecule. It will accumulate in a negatively charged environment and um, this is dependent on the memory potential, so you can, dis, you can dispense with that. We can use, and I'll show you data, where we can do different compounds, complex one inhibitors, different poisons that will disrupt that, and you can measure and you can change the, uh, the uptake. So we know that it's sensitive to these changes. Um, this is very similar to what Michael Murphy, who's pioneered this type of um, chemistry, has done with MitoClick. Uh, but this, these studies were based on um, mass spec. So every time you want to study, they did this in heart tissue but you have to euthanize an animal. You can't euthanize patients, of course. You have to euthanize an animal. 
and you have to do mass spec. So the advantage of pet tracers is that we can study them non-invasively and longitudinally. Um, and that was really an advantage. And here's some number of studies in which they developed this tracer or utilize this tracer in um, mostly heart tissue, in models of rat, um, uh, you know, canines, um, porcine, which I had to look up, that's actually a pig, and um, brown fat. So we decided to look at, is everything good? Oh, of course. We'll get it. We'll get it going. No problem. You good? Uh, I can skip through. It's all good. Yeah, you're fine. You're good. Thank you. All right. Okay. So these are some models. Okay. So how do we model lung cancer? So we have a number of different models. What I'm going to tell you about is some of these genetically engineered models, or we abbreviate GEMS, which you're all very familiar with. In lung cancer, these are, um, we utilize those that were developed by Tyler Jackson's group numbers of years ago. These are RAS driven models. We can cross these um, with, and this is just shown how these are flux alleles to, um, to modulate, you know, oncogenic deliver, um, oncogenic activation, activation of oncogenic KRAS. We can cross this with flux to alleles of your favorite tumor suppressor. We work on LKB1 extensively, P53, P10, you name it. Uh, bottom line is we can generate you know, tumors very, very rapidly, very quickly, and that even though they are genetically simple compared to the human disease, metabolically, we see a lot of similarities. And so these are a really good tool for us to use. We also pair this with um, patient drug xenografts as well as now primary patient samples. So we really have begun to, to work with that. I won't show you a lot of the work on the on the patient drives um, xenografts, but what's interesting is when you compare primary patient samples, PDXs, GEMS, metabolically, we do see a number of conserved features, which is really um, tells us that there's these defined hallmarks driving the tumors. All right, so this just shows you some um, advantages of the longitudinal imaging. Here is um, induction, we can measure, these are cross, these are KRAS, LKB1 mutant or KL tumors, cross with a luciferous reporter, and you can just see how we can measure um, tumor formation at early stages all the way up to late and advanced metastatic stages here. Um, and then this really began our quest to use more clinically relevant modalities. So this is CT imaging with contrast in a mouse and then FDG PET, the glucose analog. And so what we get is a very detailed spatial resolution. We know where the tumor is, but with PET, we also have functional readouts. And I really like that about pet tracers that we can measure function as well. And we can see how these functions change over time. And that's important to me because, you know, with therapies, the tumors are not going to stay static. And unless you're successful and completely wipe it out, which is rarely the case, they will progress. And, um, and so we really want to know as they progress, how are they changing these metabolic states, if you will. All right. Uh, these models that I'm going to be discussing are, genet are not only um, are genetically defined, but histologically very, very complex. So for, as, as scientists, you know, I've talked to people and they, they think this is a complete nightmare. Well, because it's not simple to do. I love this because we have to go in and tease out all this kind of genetic, uh, this histological heterogeneity. These are all a, a sampling of all the histologies that we see in these animals that you would see clinically. Um, and again, I'm going to be focusing on uh, squamous, uh, abbreviated LUSC, and lung adenos. Those are the two main groups. And hopefully, I'm going to convince you by the time we're done that these are completely different tumors, not just histologically, but how they behave. And so, so if you look empirically at why the patients are in such different therapy regimens, anytime you see clinical trials, it usually will exclude one histology or the other. And I think a lot of it has to do with the basic fundamental um, organization structure of these cells, cell of origin, and how these tumors work. All right, so a little background of PET imaging. Um, I know many of you are very familiar about this, uh, with this, um, but I just want to highlight that, you know, at, uh, at UCLA and as well here in many places, we're able to miniaturize these imaging units and image mice. And this allows us to get, um, you know, spatial 3D recon reconstruction and localization of these tumors. Uh, the work I'm going to talk to you about on this FBNT PET tracer, this is work that um, Sam and I began years and years ago. Um, and it's just been a fantastic collaboration. And the purpose of, of testing out this tracer was again, to measure mitochondrial and, and look at them. Um, and this is, I'm gonna show you a movie. This is work that um, was really um, pioneered and pushed by Melitza Momchilovich, um, who's now actually starting her own lab um, as an assistant professor. 
So this is a movie here of a PET CT overlay. And you can see a beautiful outline of the heart here and this very large tumor shown over here. I love the lung, it's mostly air. We have very, very nice signal to noise ratio. We also see a number of different, we see liver, we see excre excretion organs and liver, but you can see a very positive tumor here. Here's a static view of the, of the tumor here. So we started imaging more and more, then things got interesting. So if you look here, we have circled here T1 and T2. You notice there's very different uptakes of FB and TP. So we took the tumors out and started looking histologically. You can see here T1 is an adenocarcinoma, stains positive for TTF1, where T2 is a squamous tumor. When we started to uh, classify these, we saw a very significant difference in uptake of FB and TP, where the squamous had a significantly lower um, uptake than the adenocarcinomas. And of interest, they tend to cluster in these very tight, tightly clustered, where the adenos seem to segregate and have a broader distribution. So very interesting. We look at biodistribution, and we see you know, and that we see, you know, uptake in the, uh, in the normal tissue. And, um, you know, with FBNTP having very, um, not crossing the BBB and having very little brain penetrance, but hoping to fix that problem in the near future. All right. Um, okay. So next we wanted to test this and test this functionally. Um, and so what we began doing is we have a lot of experience with complex one inhibitors um, targeting the electron transport chain. And you can see here's a list of different ones that I'll be talking about. Biguanides like metformin, um, um, also known uh, clinically as glucophage. Um, it's, it's, uh, its cousin, fenformin, a much more potent, um, uh, rotenone, which is an irreversible complex one inhibitor. And this compound IACS010759 uh, developed at MD Anderson, and that has been in clinical trials. And so what we would do is we would image mice up front, give them a PET scan, give them you know, five days of treatment, and then follow up with all of PET scans. As you can see here, qualitatively, if you look at the PET scans before and after, we see um, that there is a decrease in signal. And this is quantified here, pre-treatment, post-treatment, and then this is just the summation of three independent experiments that we see a significant reduction with fenformin treatment, the complex one inhibitor, um, in the FBNTP uptake. And this is the percent change. So we did see a significant percent change. So these tumors were responding. Reviewers, however, were, were quick to point out that this is five days, what about cell death? Okay, so we look, we weren't getting any cell death, but that wasn't good enough for viewers love. So what Melita did was a, uh, a short four hour treatment course with PET imaging. So basically um, the very short assays we would do in cell culture, she basically did in a mouse. Um, and I was always really stunned by this because what we see here is with oligomyosin, which will cause hyperpolarization of the ETC. And you will see, we see um, in an increase in potential, we see a significant increase in the, in the tracer uptake. Conversely, when we use rotenone, the irreversible complex one inhibitor, we see a significant decrease. So we can actually acutely toggle um, by poisoning um, and inhibiting the electron transport chain, we can toggle the uptake of the tracer. So it's very, very responsive to changes in the electron transport chain, which was um, encouraging to us because now we have a functional readout and as these things are changing. We also looked at, um, in, in addition to fenformin, we looked at metformin, which was actually really interesting to us because it's used so commonly in a lot of other, other, um, other uh, treatments, either for repurposing or for the purposes of diabetes. And we actually saw with metformin a significant uh, decrease as well. All right, so we wanted to dig in a little bit and ask what's going on with these squamous tumors? Why is it so low? Could it be that there's something going on with complex one of these tumors? And so we had some previous data and kind of putting things together, you know, little nuggets of, of knowledge where like, hmm, that's really interesting. Not sure why that is. And one was the lung squamous tumors are very refractory complex one inhibitors. They don't simply, simply put, they don't care about inhibiting that. Um, and that was uh, work from um, Lee et al. in 2015 as well from our lab. Um, we also see that in early to advanced stage lung cancer that there is a change in sort of in the amount of these complex one um, inhibitors in which you have at later stages, you, uh, you see a loss of this NDEF S1, which is a complex one subunit uh, shown up here. And so what we began doing is it started to investigate uh, molecular level, these complex, uh, these complex um, subunits. And so what Melita found is she we would do PET imaging and then segregate the tumors based on their, in their imaging, T1 and T2, take them out and run biochemical assays. And this was really, was really important because before, you know, with these animals, you, if you just look at the CT scan, you're kind of blindly plucking at tumors. And what this taught us is that if you blindly pluck the tumor out and say, well, all tumors are Warburg, 
or all tumors do this or all that. It's not the case. You need a picture. And so when we, when we do the PET scans, to me, it was really like going into a dark room, flipping the light on and not stubbing our toes and actually navigating the room and really trying to get the first idea of what we're actually looking at. And these are two very different tumors. T1 has a very low uptake of FPNT people, very, very glycolytic. Um, when you compare these, the take home, these are very busy blots, but basically the take home message with T1, it was a squamous and T2 is an adenocarcinoma. You see dramatic differences in the glucose transporters. And then we see very large difference in these complex one subunits. So there's a down regulation going on. We looked across different tumors. These are adeno, squamous, and then these are different genetic backgrounds. We see that the squamous again have uh, a decrease in these proteins. So what about, this is my, so what about the human condition? So we looked at cell lines, human cell lines, and sure enough, we see a decrease in human cell lines. Um, this is this um, this is a company's loss of memory potential in these human cell lines. Um, we looked at respiration. We see that the respiration was significantly lower, and we see a concomitant increase in, in, in uh, ECAR, which is extracellular acidification or, or a readout for glycolysis. So really, human cell lines were mirroring what we saw metabolically in the animal. And again, this is, uh, we did blue native gels to look at complex one assembly and then um, permeabilization to specifically look at complex one. And we see again, over and over. So this taught us that we have something very unique going in, in the electron transport chain, but this is in culture. So what we really wanted, is it off again? I think we're, <laughs> we're gonna see. Can we go the sure. Then can fix it. Yay. Yes, and then okay. Oh. There we go. Okay, great. Thank you, so much. you got it. Yeah, I'm gonna let you handle that one. All right, no problem. Okay. All right. So next we wanted to essentially get to a state where we could measure some of the respiratory chain activities or ETC in vivo. So what we did is began our big march. And this is where I'm gonna show you unpublished work, uh, really sp uh, spearheaded by Ming-Chi Han, a talented postdoc in my lab. And this is work in collaboration with Orange Shriha at UCLA and Mark Ellisman at UCSD. And what we did was we began first coupling PET imaging with ex vivo respirometry on frozen tissue. So just going right to the source. And working out a flow, flow chart where we can do you know, micro CT analysis, serial block phase electron microscopy, followed by tissue segmentation and reconstruction into ultra resolution three-dimensional maps. So we'll basically march through this because, uh, so let me first show you our work where we were combining PET imaging and FP and TB uptake with respirometry. The bottom line is does, if we can measure complex one activity or two or electron transport chain activity, does that correlate with FP and TP? And this is our workflow. So induced tumor induction, we get tumors with you know, different um, subtypes. We would give them a PET scan uh, with FDG, give them a few days to rest, followed up by another PET scan with FB and TP. Take out the tumors and perform frozen um, respirometry and frozen tumors. And this is work that um, Rebecca Asen Perez and Lindsay Stiles had, had, pushed, had uh, published in 2020. And what's really fantastic about this is you're getting this max respiratory capacity. So even though it's frozen tissue, we, you can you can you can activate the mitochondria and push them, and by giving them different nutrient restrictions, you can get a very accurate idea of complex one and two activity. So I'll show you some data on that. So again, PET imaging on the tumors, we see T1 with our classic you know lung adeno positive for FB and TP. We see T2 likely a squamous tumor, uh, where it is a squamous tumor with high FDG. So how did this look? So we take out the tumors, and this is our max respiratory capacity or oxygen consumption, how much of these mitochondria are consuming oxygen. And you see in the lung adeno, very high complex one and two activity compared to lung squamous. And we just confirmed the phenotypes as always to make sure the histology is correct. So this is the analysis when we did the, the correlative analysis. We see a, an incredibly significant correlation between complex one, uh, so FB and TP uptake and complex one activity shown here. What's really interesting is that we also see these tumor populations segregate into two distinct populations with lung squamous down here and, um, and uh, lung adenocarcinomas here. So we have distinct tumor populations and we have a tracer so that we have high confidence that when we see a positive signal, 
that we're actually seeing a, a tumor increase with high respiratory activity. FDG had the exact opposite, so inverse correlation with FDG activity, making sense. And again, the population segregates. So this was really encouraging. Now I will qualify, this is in genetically engineered mice. So it's simple. We are doing this work in, in um, you know, human tumors and we are seeing some very important trends. However, human tumors are very heterogeneous and complex. And so it's never gonna be quite as, as clean as this, but we're moving in the right direction. And the thing, the advantage that this takes is now we have two modes of analysis. We have non-invasive pet imaging, but if we take core needle biopsies, can we actually begin to do some respiratory analysis? So um, tumors, with, tumors that we can excise sur through surgical resection that are large, great. Small, we're looking at, you know, this may not be optimal. Okay, so I wanna show you what we did with um, the actual image analysis and break this down. So I'll show you here, this is, uh, these are high-res uh, CT scans. And orange is the, it's a beautiful lung par parenchyma. You can see the branching airways in this animal. And this is a, this is a, a KRAS driven gem. And we see a, a very large tumor here. Um, and so what we would do then is um, excise a piece. And so the PET with the CT really gives us spatial resolution. Okay, we know where we want to go with the tumor. We know top to bottom, left to right, front to back. And so orientating this was really important. And we would, um, I'm not gonna show you this data, but we actually cut these tumors in half and then cross-reference its mirror image with histology. So we can select for live viable tissue, segregate that from necrosis and actually go in with different markers. So that's really nice. And then this is what the, tum the tumor looks like. And we begin to process this serially. So the electron beam will scan, it will slice, scan, slice, scan, slice. And we get 250 to 500 slices per tissue. So we get a lot of two-dimensional um, EM images that we can now begin reconstructing into a single image. Okay, and this movie's not playing, but just take my word for it. This is a three-dimensional block of tissue with ultra resolution. So we have a huge amount of information. We can now deconvolute, um, segment, and then put back together. All right, um, so I'll show you some, here's a, um, topography, three-dimensional topography of the tumor landscape. So these are individually segmented cells color-coded by the type. So you can see here in blue are the squamous cells. They're loaded with immune cells as well because these are immune competent mice. Um, you see here in yellow neutrophils, we have macrophages, um, et cetera. So we have um, really the full landscape. All right. So then, um, so then the next step is to really begin segmenting. So I'm going to show you some work where we were honing in and concentrating on individual lung cancer cells. So this is a two-dimensional SBEM analysis with multicolor tracing, uh, manual tracing of you know, different mitochondria. And this is, what, and this is uh, what the cell looks like, the tumor cell 3D reconstructed. This is a lung adeno that's positive for our FBNTP tracer. In blue is the nucleus and these beautiful mitochondrial networks are in red. And you can see that there are some very long fused networks. They localize both in a perinuclear uh, juxtaposed to the nucleus, but also throughout the cytoplasm in the cell. So a beautiful distribution of these. And I'll get to you, um, and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, some area when we're looking at this, you know, this large space in between. In other words, what, what are some of the other organelles occupying the space? All right, so what does the squamous look like that's negative, um, completely opposite, highly fragmented networks, mostly localized perinuclear. Um, so these are, so these, we suspected that these, these mitochondria even though they're numerous and abundant, they're not functional, okay? And that's not surprising. But what was really cool is this is actually from a tumor. And this is actually con convincing us that, you know, of what we can actually start to do and render. So we had a little bit of a problem. Um, if you do the, you know, we did the math and, and if you take all this manual tracing and you start to build this, it would take my postdoc, take me chi about four weeks to do slices. So with 300 cells, that would be about a decade's worth of work. So she is far smarter than I and came up with a strategy, which was deep learning um, um, convolution neural networks. Okay, so take advantage of this AI technology. All right, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I wanna give you an idea of what we might. So we collaborated with Stefano Swato's lab in the UCLA Vision Institute. And this is, um, and this is a UNET convolution neural network. And basically what they developed it back in 2015 is, is for biomedical image segmentation, right? Reading 
you know, for radiology, reading CT scans, reading MRIs. We ask really simple, can we train it to read mitochondria? Um, so how this works is you get this processing and you get the sequencing and you do this manual tracing and that's your ground truth. And you're gonna put this into this training module and it's an iterative process. And so how this training process is, this is the UNED is what it does is it starts to break down individual parameters. So I always, um, the analogy is facial recognition. It's gonna break it down to individual parameters. Um, and so, and then it's gonna begin de um, deconstruct and then reconstruct. As you break this down, it gives weights. So it's gonna assign the mitochondrial phenotypes and features higher weights than those not. So when you reconstruct, a nose, an eye, an ear will get a higher weight than let's say a chair. So when we reconstruct, we can find faces in the crowd and distinguish that from an from a empty seat. And so what we're doing is we're reconstructing and distinguishing it. Um, so the, the, the program is learning. Okay, it's, we were able to, um, to basically uh, develop this, this iterative process um, and relying heavily on these ground truth models. So we had to do a lot of tracing. So there was an immense, immense amount of work that went into this. And we've been able to achieve um, at uh, currently a 92% accuracy between our machine learning and our ground truth. So, and it's getting better over time. That's the best part. The other thing is it takes about four hours. So, you know, so you can, and that's doing, you know, 150 to 300 cells in a, in a piece. So we're, we're getting better. And so basically what Ming-Chi was able to do is increase her, our output by four to five orders of magnitude. Um, so quite, quite an effort. And we're really thankful for, um, for you know, Stefano's work. And that would be with Alex Tiard and Alex Wong. Um, okay. So let's put this all together. So here's, my, um, here's basically the PET imaging, the three-dimensional three reconstruction. And now we're looking at two-dimensional slices of individual mi uh, mitochondria that you would see in a textbook, you would see. And you see the mitochondria with the beautifully organized cristae. Uh, you see now shorter mitochondria. And what we began doing is then reconstructing them into these three-dimensional structures. All right, and, we've, and then here is the, um, the actual rendering of these. So we put them into three classes based on the literature, these canonical structures. So when you see mitochondria that are more elongated with these beautifully folded cristae, these would be your orthodox or more lamellar type one, we call them. All right, we also see these cristae that are more fragmented and short, either disorganized cristae, they're sparse, they're still folded, they're just not that many. Uh, a lot of a lot of matrix, we call that disruptive type two. And then we have these um, swollen matrices. So the cristae forms in these really nice junctions and they form this tight junction here. And this is where you have all the membrane potential and the good stuff. So as they start to open up and swell, as you see in type three, they lose the membrane potential and their function. This is also gonna impact now respiration and the efficiency. But here's what really, really, really um, is still making our heads scratch. And, and it just shows you the power of how these tumors adapt. These tumors with these really disorganized mitochondria grow the most aggressively. These are the ones we see typically in squamous tumors. All right, so let's go through some of the, the data that we can extract from this. So these are, you know, these are just thousands of networks done in these, um, in these histograms. And what we can see is this is fragmentation showing that squamous have very highly fragmented mitochondria that we knew. Um, and we see, you know, these, but we're now able to get these broad distributions. So as we apply this, it's going to be very important for human cancers because we're going to see a very large um, likely distribution, or maybe not. So one thing that's interesting is we looked at parameters like distance and other structural. The squamous tumors, we kept seeing these very, very narrow histological peaks, and that's very unique to us because we're seeing actual homogeneity as well as heterogeneity. Is that going to translate to nutrient preferences and activity? Possibly. It's a, it's a way we can start to distinguish these. Um, and I will tell you, as I'll show you at the end of the talk, that these squamous tumors have very, very defined nutrient dependencies, where the lung anodes have a very broad dependency and they can actually um, are very adaptable. All right. And this is the analysis of the cristae structure. You can see that the lung anodes have a kind of an even distribution between type one, two, and three cristae um, with lots of normal healthy cristae. And then these squamous tumors predominantly are type three. So it's really shocking to us and it tells us that there's a lot of compensation that goes in. They're working very hard to keep their mitochondria healthy to prevent apoptosis and likely ramping up TCA cycling and oncometabolites to support these processes. What we really think is happening here is this is sort of, they're finding sort of an optimal sweet spot, if you will, downregulate complex one and DTC enough, but don't do it so much that you become like a row null cell, right? Tumors actually have to have mitochondria to grow. Um, but 
they work better when they downregulate these things. So there's really this yin and yang process that we're starting to really try to wrap our head around. All right. So we next um, wanted to, since you know the, the cell is more than just mitochondria, it's more than the nucleus, there's lots of organelles. We asked, um, we really were interested about this distinct spatial organization between the adenos and the squamous. In particular, what was going on in all the empty space, right? So I love this about pictures. You can take a picture, you can interrogate it and then ask, hmm, what's this, what's that? Trace it, reconstruct it and see what comes out the other end. So one thing we noted was in these FPNTP positive lung adenos, very high concentration of lipid droplets. This was really interesting because our collaborator, Oren Shrihai, in the study by Benador et al. had found this, these um, peri-droplet mitochondrial populations in brown adipose tissue. And this is uh, the schematic in which they showed, in which these peridroplet mitochondria here are utilized to, they utilize pyruvate, they synthesize uh, fatty acids that then feed um, the free cytoplasmic mitochondria. So they're coordinating, they're compartmentalizing and coordinating. And this is the, the showing the brown adipose tissue. We see the same thing in lung adipose. It really was interesting to us because for, year, for a while, I was like, no, we're not gonna have lipid droplets. We had to, so I went with my tail between my legs and said, you're right, Orion, there's massive lipid droplets. So what does it look like when we reconstruct it? This is what we get where now we still have mitos in red and we have these lipid droplets in green. We see these beautiful lipid droplets dispersed and these mitos wrapping themselves around and, and in a network fashion, contacting multiple lipids. And, and so we're very fascinated about what regulates this, um, are they, is this a form of compartmentalization? Um, and I'm gonna show you, could we, and, and is this gonna impact nutrient dependencies? In other words, what metabolites are they depending on to support respiration? Glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, all right. So, and this is a three-dimensional, a two-dimensional rendering. You can see this beautiful uh, mitochondrial contacting multiple lipids, and this is the three-dimensional rendering here. And what Ming-Chi noted that is, is observed in the literature is that if you notice, they align their cristae, perfect symmetry. And mitochondria will do this, and they will do this in muscles. They will actually align themselves, and this is not a random fluke. So it's really fascinating when we actually look and look at the in the cristae concentration, the type of cristae in a peridroplet mitochondria, it's predominantly type one, highly organized, highly efficient. Not surprising that these are the same tumors that have very high rate complex one and two activity and high FBNTP. So we're connecting the dots and really starting to, to try and understand this. All right. So what about the squamous tumors? There's a near complete paucity of lipid droplets and peridroplet mitochondria. And that's just shown in the quantification here. They just really don't exist. So that's very unique to us because you have now something that likely we would have then hypothesized may not be dependent on fatty acid oxidation or at least utilizing it in this, this way. When we look again <clears throat> at the percent distribution, we see that um, we see this again, this, this, um, this distribution with squamous, which says that the mitochondria are predominantly perinuclear or, or in the cytoplasm. And, uh, and so this is something very unique to lung animals. All right. We confirm, Ming-Chi confirmed this in both genetically engineered models as well as human xenografts. This is oil red O staining of um, just to stain lipids. And we see that there's a high concentration uh, in the lung animals compared to, to squamous. Um, and that was quite encouraging us that this also was found in human condition. Does that mean that all lung adenos have oil red O lipid drop positive lipid droplets? Absolutely not. Does it mean that all squamous? No. This means that we can segregate these, but likely if we think of like all tumors on a Venn diagram, there's going to be an overlap. Uh, but <clears throat> we do see these conserved phenotypes over and over again, which is exciting for us in the, in the you know, in human cancers. So this is um, Bodipi staining of my, and mitochondrial staining, mitochondrial in fuchsia uh, and Bodipi in green. And you can see here, these are um, highly um, active uh, lung squamous, uh, sorry, highly um, uh, Oxfos proficient lung squamous cell lines, and you see loaded with peridrop with um, these peridroplet mitochondria that we've quantified. And then we looked more at these squamous tumors. Um, this is a lung squamous, and we also began looking at things like head and neck squamous. Not surprising, they have a conserved phenotypes as well. So across cancers, phenotypes are conserved, and we see this again drop out. So this was exciting in terms of 
what we have going on regarding finding this phenotype. And now we're really starting to piece this together on what drives this and what are some of the pathways that drive this. Um, all right, so <clears throat> what about nutrient dependencies? So shown here is really beginning to integrate how do nutrient dependencies that fuel the TCA cycle and that, and that ultimately supports electron transport chain. So what are these tumors depending on? So we using seahorse, we can actually interrogate um, the glycolysis basically pyruvate using a mitochondrial pyruvate or MPC inhibitor. We can see how much they depend on pyruvate. We can use etamoxir to inhibit fatty acid oxidation and glutamine. And we use this glutaminase inhibitor, Biptis. Um, and so what we found back here, what we found is, is if you look at um, the adenose here, there's a decrease across the board with um, the pyruvate inhib inhibition Edamoxir or Biptis. It shows that they absolutely depend on all three of those and we'll utilize those. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting is when we look at these squamous, they are not responsive to Edamoxir. And that absolutely 100% agrees with the fact that we don't see these lipid droplets. And it's really interesting. The other thing that's really fascinating is then that means that they're very dependent on supporting glycolysis and amino acid metabolism. And we just happened to had a study previous years in squamous where we found they're very dependent on glucose and glutamine, and we could actually target that. So this, so we tested this in media. And what Ming-Chi found is she basically just stripped out basic nutrients from the media. And I love this experiment because it's elegant and it tells us so much. If you look at these oxbos proficient, respiratory competent um, lung adenose cells, you see that if you, if you reduce um, low glucose, they still grow. Glutamine across the board, you take out glutamine and it's all cells die. They need glutamine in culture. But then when you took out fatty acids, they, they stopped growing as well. And this was a cell line I told you before, showed you that it had very, very high peridrop mitochondria. So then we look here at the squamous tumors and we see again, um, when you restrict glucose, they're not happy. Um, but fatty acids, stripping them from free fatty acids, they grow right through it. So this is really interesting that we've seen. All right, so, so this is sort of what we're trying to put, a, put together we don't yet know why they're, they're truly losing fatty acid oxidation. And, and like I said, this is something where we will have to do the lipidomics before we really can make those, those assessments. This is all based on nutrients that support respiration, and, um, but we're very interested in pursuing this and really un, uh, understanding in particular tumors that have very restricted nutrient preferences. Um, find those nutrient preferences and can we target those? So this, is the, this gets to the last part where I wanna talk about therapeutically targeting metabolism. And I have a lot to thank Sam about for this because we would have great discussions and he always ends it with, so what? You know, you do mouse gymnastics and you have these wonderful models, but it doesn't really mean anything unless you get it into patients. And so this is always something that I appreciate from, you know, my colleagues like Sam and my clinicians. We have to make this something that's, that's clinically relevant and tangible. So let me show you our strategy of what we're looking for in, in sort of, um, grouping, at least in terms of lung cancer. This is an old outdated slide, but it just points that there's a number of mutations in, in lung cancer, and we can genetically stratify patients. You know, basic ones like KRAS and EGFR dominate. Until recently, there's, there was no KRAS treatments. Now there's targeted therapies with modest effect. Mod and EGFR, third generation inhibitors work well. But you'll see there's still many, many patients when we get samples in, there's no defined mutations. So they go on standard chemotherapy plus immune oncology, immunotherapy. All right. Squamous, it's even worse. Uh, you know, there's not many targeted therapies. And so most of these patients are on chemo IO treatments. All right. So our thought is this, is can you take, you know, either genetically stratified tumors or those that are unknown and to basically start to metabolically stratify. Um, and this is not restricted to lung cancer. We can do this on all of And then basically defining these. Um, and so it's, we're not, we compare this with, um, we compare these um, with uniform metabolic dependencies and precise treatment. Some advantages, this is independent of the mutational. So if you see, you know, when we started sequencing our PDXs, I was astounded by the sheer number of mutations that just keep pouring out. And so I could, you know, think that maybe I'm gonna do a BRAF inhibitor or maybe a TOR inhibitor or all these, but that's a bit of a shot in the dark. And sadly, you know, patients and friends of ours may get, you know, sequencing from foundation medicine or other types of places they'll get a lot of data back, but not a lot of tractable therapies. And so by doing these mutations, you're talking about basic 
um, nutrient dependencies, pathways that are absolutely conserved. And when you start to restrict, the question is now will you start to restrict the tumor growth? Um, and so that's our strategy. It's a salvage, it's, it's a salvage treatment. And these are patients that are, you know, have failed, you know, chemotherapy, immune therapy, and as well in the targeted therapy space as well. We're very interested. Um, so, so if you will, you know, it's 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 a new, it's it's an expansion of this idea of lineage plasticity, if you will, where is metabolic adaptation really an extension that in addition to genetic heterogeneity, metabolic uh, and now metabolic heterogeneity to be considered. And really, if you look at the you know, these patients within here, we're very excited about the possibility of really profiling these patients independent of the mutations and treating them. All right. So the premise here is this idea of therapeutic window. And, and this is why these have, have um, been successful, at least in our hands preclinical that I'll show you. This is nothing new. This was the same story we had with, you know, when um, Brian Drucker was developing Gleevec. There's no way a kinase inhibitor can actually do that. You're going to inhibit all kinases and, and kill not so fast. There's a very defined therapeutic window. And I would argue that there's an equally defined therapeutic window with metabolism. The tumors, especially the most aggressive tumors, like these squamous tumors I'm showing you, they are truly off the charts in terms of metabolic activity. And so as we start to suppress this, we are not damaging normal tissue. We are not even stressing normal tissue. If we look for metabolic outputs, like activation of AMP kinase, for example, which will activate in your nutrient stress, you'll see it go up. No idea why that's doing that. Um, but you're not seeing tissue dying, okay? So we have a nice therapeutic window. So what we decided to do is, you know, is, is exploit this. So I'm gonna show you a couple avenues. And really, if we, if we over, this is oversimplified, but if we really break this into state A and state B, where these are our more FBNTP positive or OXFAS proficient tumors in B, and these are more glycolytic tumors in A, how might we, how might we, uh, we treat these and target these? Okay, so one would be looking at glucose metabolism um, and another, you know, these tumors, and then in these, looking at oxalase inhibitors, such as biguanides or this IACS compound. Um, okay, so let's talk about the oxfos high or oxfos proficient. And so that's really looking at this population here. So this is segregating out based on these tumor, um, his, uh, these tumor histologies, these subtypes with the FBNTP uptake and looking at this oxfos high. And the threshold we've really done is that which is basically over 0.5% um, percent, percent injected dose per gram. So we're really also in, in future studies really trying to quantify this and say, well, what, you know, is there actually a quantifiable number? Um, all right, and so the premise is that if you're positive for this, would you be, you should predictably be uh, sensitive to complex one inhibitors, those negative tumors, no. So very, very simple kind of binary, yes or no, all right. And we use this complex one inhibitor, ICS. Um, and this is, uh, these are A549, um, very commonly used KRAS, LKD1 mutant, xenograft, it's a lung adeno. We see very significant inhibition with ISCS. And these are in our KRAS, LKD1 gems. Again, we see a significant inhibition in the FBNTB positive tumor. So we did, you know, xenografts, we've done PDXs, we've done gems. They seem to be working well. Um, however, we don't tend to get much apoptosis. So this seems to be more of a static effect and tumors will adapt. So one thing that we're, we're you know, ongoing is, is complex one inhibition, TC inhibition actually going to be clinically tractable because we also, ISCS, unfortunately, they're finding high toxicity with these compounds. Makes sense, right? So can we develop things like prodrugs? Possibly. One thing we found is, is this idea of manipulating the networks, take advantage of the plasticity and pushing these tumors in different distinct states by remodeling their mitochondria and then screening and saying, okay, now do we have an a permissive state, whatever that state be, and run that against standard of care therapies. So this is something we're excited about and doing. And of course, we can use pet imaging to monitor these, monitor these adaptive states. That's the goal, monitor over time. Have to convince our radiologists that we're gonna give multiple pet images um, you know, with patient scans, and it's gonna be a lot of money, but that's the breaks because this is what we wanna do. So I'm hoping and encouraging, encourage basically talking with all of you today and seeing the great work here because this is such a focal point and such a, you've invested so much in that it's really encouraging to see that because I really, I really think combining um, pet imaging non-invasively with this is really good um, and hopefully a tractable approach. All right, so what about this population, the negative population? 
Um, and that's really highlighted, um, highlighted here. So if you see the, the high glucose uptake, you know, we thought immediately, well, let's just go after glucose metabolism. So we use this compound, these TOR inhibitors, MLN-128. Um, uh, and squamous tumors, a hallmark of squamous tumors are they're very, very glycolytic. So this is patient data, this is our gem data, and this is uh, data taken from, uh, from the animals and it's replicated in uh, patients. And this is work we did with um, J1 Kim at UT Southwestern. And, and work that Melitza did in mice in uh, 2018, just demonstrating that there's this very high glycolytic signature. So we kind of thought that was a home run. You have a, high, you have a glycolytic tumor, hit it with a glycolysis inhibitor, we're good, right? Um, not so fast. This is our data that basically ultimately ended up as at, if you just looked at the CT scans uh, as a failed experiment, where we treat with this mTOR inhibitor, it's a kind, mTOR kinase inhibitor, MLN128. Um, it's also known as TAC228. Um, because apparently these inhibitors change names every three months. Um, you can see, if you look at the FDG scans, the inhibitor inhibited FDG very nicely. So glucose flux down significantly. If you look at the tumor, the CT scan, it grew. So if we were just looking at the CT scan, we would say, well, it's a failed experiment, but because we layered on FDG and had a functional PET tracer, we knew that we were doing something metabolically to the tumor. The tumor adapted. That's what tumors do, right? Um, so this is my plug for resist versus persist criteria. I feel like I'm preaching to the converted, so I won't spend too much time there. But you know, with MLN, we see too that a common feature is that many of these compounds are very, very good compounds. They hit their target. They do a great job. And this is exactly the case. It's just that the tumors get creative and think about different ways. Um, and so much of the evidence that many people have done, this is nothing that we, you know, in a ha moment was, what are they utilizing? We looked at glutamine metabolism. And this is, you know, meant a number of different studies in both squamous carcinomas, pancreas, gliomas at the time showed this. Um, and, and I just want to highlight, you know, in addition to the, the, the PET scans, you know, this is just a basic bread and butter histology. You know, we do the marker showing these just the pink is just positive for squamous staining with DK5. And you see here the KI67, this is a proliferation in disease. Nothing changes. These tumors are growing quite aggressively. Um, but again, the phospho4-BP is our mTOR marker, our biomarker, and the drug works fantastic. So we know we're doing something. So, so um, we knew we saw some adaptation. Okay, so this is PET imaging we did with C11 glutamine. Um, in, and you see these tumors, are, this is a squamous tumor, very positive, and FDG, very positive. So we saw dual tracing and dual uptake. And so this is the model that we built in which these have flux, high flux of both nutrients. So it's just a balancing act. If you shut down one arm, it's gonna upregulate the other. That's what they're supposed to do. Um, so what happens when we shut down both arms? Um, so yeah, so this is, um, so basically what we found is that, you know, they're dependent on glucose and glutamine for some reasons we're still trying to figure out. They don't seem to support their growth of fatty acid oxidation. Um, and this is the model in which we're, we tested is target MLN plus this uh, glutaminate inhibitor CB839. And this was in collaboration with, with Calathera uh, demonstrating that. And um, so this is our combination treatment. And this is the data. And this is a summary. This is a PDX. And we saw this over and over, whether it was in GEMS or PDXs. Individually, each drug did not work well. Combinatorially, it worked beautifully. So this was a really, really interesting in, in, for us in that we really needed to find combinatorial therapies. And, and so we, um, we partnered with uh, folks at UC Davis and MSK uh, to start a clinical trial. And this is, um, you know, that began in 2020 and now we've, we've begun. So, um, so we're very excited about that um, in the prospects. And we have um, a handful of patients that have begun treatment. We have a, a number of responders. We also have people who are progressing and non-responders. So it's exactly as we would expect. So we're excited about the um, exploratory biomarker analysis that we're gonna do and really pair this with our PDX models um, and these patient samples and identify what are the key signatures, what's the background noise that we can get to. All right, so this really just shows how we're expanding stratification. We don't have to be wedded to lung cancer per se. We can look at head and neck. We can look at sarcomas like osteosarcoma, triple negative breast cancer, LPR, therapy resistant, you name it, it's a metabolic signature and all tumors 
do this. And so this is the idea, you know, if you will, a basket trial or however. I will say though that cancer people tend to be pretty siloed and we tend to kind of get bin. So this is a hurdle. And this is why I think these times are really important for us to talk and meet and, and come up with ways in which we can expand these to different cancer um, patients, you know, because, um, you know, you don't have to necessarily be just a lung cancer person to be, to have a reason to work on triple negative breast cancer. So that's my plug for that. All right. So we're excited about this clinical trial um, that's going on and, and we're um, hoping to expand ultimately translation on these, if not these compounds, other combinatorial drugs, as we learn, as we become you know, better um, and really helping that. So I just want to summarize and wrap up um, in this, you know, what we've, what I've told you and what we've done, you know, in the space of imaging mitochondria, developing FP and TP with Sam, and it's been a really great journey. Um, and we're combining that with in vivo, ex vivo respirometry and really trying to find clinical ways in which we can do this. We're hoping that this will impact diagnostics, and we are exploring not only FB and, TP, FB and TP's application to, because remember, the mitochondrial structure, as it changes, so does its function. So if we see dramatic drops in FB and TP, how does the structure change? We are, and how might those tracers be correlated with things like standard chemotherapy? Even? So we've begun answering that, and we're getting some interesting results. And then can we actually expand things like complex one inhibitors, by guanides? things like ICS. Unfortunately, I think with some of the toxicity, um, we've also been, you know, thinking about um, using some of these small molecules as primers to create permissive states. We'll see how that works out. Um, very excited about the PET three-dimensional imaging. We now have our first atlases. So we have ultrastructure. We have even dived into the immune cells and how that cooperates. There's lots to begin. And I told you stuff about gems. We have patient, we have patient samples now to start are really tacklings, but we're really excited about that. And really understanding how organelles communicate with themselves, with, with one another, um, and also how each how the cells communicate with themselves. Um, you know, cancer cells are, are quite greedy and, and they tend to take advantage of the immune cells and, and tend to use these things in terms of this cooperative uh, nutrient exchange. So we're very interested in how these things are all playing out. Um, and lastly, I just, uh, you know, where we're going with clinical trials, I showed you, you know, one trial that we've had with good success, and we're really hoping to take this approach, even with standard of care therapies, can we start to integrate certain metabolic stratification in there? Um, the biggest thing we're excited about with this trial is our chance to do biomarker development, um, and really begin stratifying these patients. I, like I said, I think there's beautiful, very wonderful drugs out there with beautiful activity. I just think it's context, and, and so, you know, if we you know, if we, our goal is really trying to better um, go back and create this as an iterative process, essentially. Can we, can we find those patient populations? And in lung cancer, if you find 10 to 5 to 10% people who respond, that's a huge number. So we're not trying to cure everyone yet. We're really trying to keep focused. Last little story I'll say is this is how we saw with the EGFR inhibitors when they first started back in the early 2000s. 2004 to six trials were a, a complete bust. They were looking at EGFR amplification. It doesn't do anything. Patients looked like they've been on hospice. It was the point mutations that would tease out within those massive data sets, the L85R, Gleci19. Then they became resistant to first generations with T790. Well, now you're on a third generation osimeritib. Patients are living a year and a half to two years. It's amazing. So this is the type of thing of going in and, and taking that massive subset and saying, well, you're still talking about thousands of patients buried within that. And so this is a thing about, we don't, we think there's a lot of great success stories that do get buried and lost within this data. And so as much as we see, when we look at our patient samples, we maybe have in our clinical trial, 13 patients, we have responders, partial and non. So we're very excited about the distribution and we're very interested in those that responded to find that signature and say, this is a signature for if you respond, for those who didn't, we want not to waste your time. We want to find something that works better. Um, and that's really ultimately the, the essence is we don't really want to waste people's time, right? Going through lots of random treatments that aren't going to make any difference. So again, um, the, best, the most important slide, those people who actually did the work. Um, so I want to thank my lab, um, Melitza, uh, for really the, uh, all the great work, both the um, 
the work with the clinical translation, um, the glucose, the um, MLN CB839 study, as well as the FPNTP study. Ming Chi for a fantastic work um, in developing this three dimensional SBEM analysis and these convolution network um, analyses. It's been great. Um, my collaborator, Stefano Suato, um, and, his, and both Alex and, uh, and um, both Alex's for their work with this um, deep learning algorithms, Orion for his help with, and, and Lindsay and Rebecca for all their work with respirometry. Sam, very grateful for all your help and collaboration. It's been a, it's been a fun ride and I hope we continue a lot more. And then of course, uh, Mark Ellisman uh, at UCSD um, for the great work with the um, EM image analysis and Jonathan and Paul for taking a chance to do a clinical trial with uh, you know, a PhD from UCLA on metabolism. All right, I'll, take, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, David, for that incredible talk. I mean, this work is so beautiful, so translational. And um, it's amazing to me that you're mapping the metabolic spatial heterogeneity of lung cancers. And, and, and it's amazing that you found this way to, to target all of the metabolic pleiotropy, because exactly as you said, you worry if you're only going in with a drug that targets the de novo pathway, the salvage pathway is still there. And so this is such a nice empirical way of targeting, um, a poly-targeting, which is amazing. Yeah. So I'll start with one question quickly, and then Lara has a question already, and there's one in the back. Greg as well. We'll go to Greg next and then Laura. Um, so very quickly, um, you said that even with some, you know, even though you're targeting this metabolic pleiotropy um, multiply, there's still that metabolic adaptation of the tumor and it's continually adapting. So do you have any evidence or you sort of hinted at it in your talk that it's actually the niche itself that may require to be targeted? Is the niche in the lung actually helping the tumor overcome some or adapt metabolically? And do you, is there a, po a possibility you'll need to target the niche as well? For example, is there a, an immunosuppressive niche in lung cancer? I don't know this, but. Yeah, okay, great question. So the answer is yes. Um, this is still very early days. We are now looking at you know, the immune microenvironment and looking at immune metabolism and how it's all related. So and the simple answer is yes, we, we need to do that. And how is that happening? Um, you know, um, the environment absolutely matters. So the lung is constantly bombarded. Um, so I would say that, you know, the lung tissue is very, very good at dealing with oxidative stress and dealing with these stresses. So there's inborn innate pathways that we have to take and consider. Um, I think they're very, very good at upregulating these pathways. Um, and then how does it compensate? So one thing we're, we're exploring is there's been a ton of work in the, in the immune space, especially in, for example, LKB1 or SDK11 mutant tumors, KEEP1, they have a high amount of, they're, the infiltrating tumor cells are very different populations and very suppressive. Um, but it is tantalizing to think as we start to manipulate metabolism in those, can we actually change some of those readouts? And of course, this is something where we're really needing and will be collaborating with, you know, immunologists mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, both, both oncology as well as just basic immunology to get that understanding because we're we're at early days but i would say that the field is doing an amazing job progressing and understanding this um and then I, I don't know if i've really answered in terms of the the niche but yeah it absolutely matters and and people are now really looking at the whole physiology of you know, the disease so i think it's exciting and hopefully we can actually start to learn from a lot of these studies and then apply mm -hmm. them back yeah, absolutely. Two advantages I think you have is that it's really hard to study the niche in, especially the immune niche in an immunocompromised host with mm -hmm. the PDX model, but you have these beautiful gems that right. you can use. And um, yeah, so let me go to Greg's question so I don't waste too much yeah, time. I really, thanks, David. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I was really intrigued with your uh, lipid problem. Yes. That's we precisely think that. Following on yeah. to that, I mean, there's even combination treatments with glucose and glutamine. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you see complete disappearance of lipid droplets in mm -hmm. the cell? Because you're obviously bringing yeah. the glucose. <laughs> So we're actually doing those experiments right now and, and really basically reverse engineering 
um, we've done the glucose restriction in the squamous tumors. And so that's where Ming-Chi is now standing to see if we, if once we restrict glucose, do we see this formation of lipids? Does it switch metabolic um, signatures, dependencies? What I can tell you is what the mitochondria do. Once you restrict glucose metabolism, glucose flux in them, they completely remodel. It's remarkable. They redistribute, they become motile. Um, I didn't want to keep you guys here for three hours, so I spared you that data, but it's absolutely remarkable. They become motile, they're criste form, but they still grow as a carcinoma, but they, they've definitely remodeled. Do the big question is, will they now be able to form lipid droplets? We're not sure. Um, going with the adenocarcinomas, they, in all of our models, this, we think these, these lipids are absolutely protective, like you would see in an adipose tissue. This was the shocking thing, is they have so many behavior traits like you would see in white adipose tissue. Just took us a while to actually take the images and convince ourselves that this is happening. If we treat these models with chemotherapy, nothing. If we treat them as cytotoxic, nothing. We haven't looked at things like lipid peroxidation and other types of things, but but this is, the, this is what's so great is as we see the phenotypes in the cellular architecture, can we be more clever than the tumor and say, well, let's go after different nodes that we normally just would never have thought of. Um, very interesting um, point. And I think it's really great. And it just speaks to where we're actually trying to work backwards and learn from normal tissue and cell of origin and really how these things are, 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 are playing into the cancer itself. Great questions. Laura. Yeah. So, so um, the I'll start with the 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 BBB. So Sam is hopefully making some great progress. We've been chatting. It's something that we've been collaborating on, um, and it's something that we are. That is the next frontier, right? Get this tracer into the brain, not just for mets and brain mets, but also all kinds of you know aging, Alzheimer's, you name it. So that's that's a, a very um, astute question that that we are working on actively. Okay. And then in terms of the topography maps, that is um, something um, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the software, but we are basically able to do some use some really beautiful 3D, 3D reconstruction software. Um, and I have, you know, in more slides, I sort of have the, uh, the outline and the flow on that, but, and that would be, um, the good news is that we're actually publishing all that. So we're putting a paper together where we're gonna lay all that out. So we're gonna have that as an open format for people to take advantage of. Um, I can't make any promises with the light, with how much the software costs. It's, it's very expensive. Um, so expensive that my post like travels two hours down to San Diego to go process it. Um, but it's, you know, we're hoping to, to make more of a user-friendly uh, platform. So I'd be happy to talk with you more about that in detail at some time. Awesome. I'll take one last question, please. Yeah, we're, we're doing actually the trias and C and, and palmitate feeding, the reciprocal experiments um, and, and, and testing those out right now. Um, and that's in conjunction in terms of if figuring out we're doing that in conjunction with actually purifying out the, the, the different populations to see not only um, what they depend on, but what they're producing. Because we think, we think, actually it's, we think they're actually um, producing free fatty acids and we think they're actually dependent on pyruvate to be determined. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but yeah, that's a great question. That's, yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember, we, we did, I mean, she did one quick Western blot and I don't, I'm trying to remember if we saw much change. I don't know if we saw much change in, in that, um, but it's still a little bit early days because we're going to interrogate, um, interrogate that a lot deeper 
as well as just understanding the mechanism of what's actually driving those together and apart. Now, these two are very high um, Which ones? The ones with the lipid droplets? Oh no, they're they seem to be um, quite the opposite. They seem to be quite you know quite a bit of oxygen, and it's a great point because that's the other thing is. Can FENTP be used as a surrogate marker of hypoxia? So great question. And, and then we're thinking the same lines. Thank you, Dr. Bedard. Wonderful. Well, help me thank Dr. Shackle for this amazing comment. And I just love the sort of spectrum of the talk, the way you sort of walk us through the beginning of the story. It really is the bench. I mean, we'll see when we get there. It's been a fun experience. And kind of a humbling experience because you see, like, when you get the patients, like, they're all challenged. It's just such a different animal. And that's why, you know, we were talking just a little bit about I hope that you have a Thank you no way. Yeah, awesome. I just saw Ruben Akista. Very good. So very nice. Anyway, the look at Ross is a very nice part. Thank you. What we have a similar story. Liver here, where we definitely see your documents are very liver droplet and meaning. Yeah, well, I'd love to I'd love to chat with you, you know, with your brain and vice versa. You know, because we don't do much with HCC, but it's very different. So we're a little surprised to see what's in the room. What are they doing here? I know. It's, yeah. And then, of course, the minimum question is what's, what's regulating it? We have some pretty cool clues, but we're going to be hiring you. So you should have some crisper screen. Go back to your PhD or AMK. That's the obvious thing. That's why you know, I actually uh, working with Ruben. I'm talking to him. I'm going to be hitting you up for a lot of reasons. Yeah. 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 Luckily, yeah. he's, he's been really good. Oh, that's so, good. That's good. Sorry, I didn't. Oh, oh yeah. lost her great. Great. Yeah, yeah, I didn't get this. It's all right. Appreciate it. It's all right. Yeah, like I said, it'll be great to chat with you. I'm going to stumble on this. I mean, I'm going to be using